Now there happened to be there a worthless man whose name was Sheba, the son of Bikri, a Benjamite. And he blew the trumpet and said, We have no portion in David, and we have no inheritance in the son of Jesse. Every man to his tents, O Israel. So all the men of Israel withdrew from David and followed Sheba, the son of Bikri. But the men of Judah followed their, their king steadfastly from the Jordan to Jerusalem. And David came to his house at Jerusalem, and the king took ten concubines whom he had left to care for the house and put them in a house under guard and provided for them, but he did not go into them. So they were shut up until the day of their death, living as if in widowhood. Then the king said to Amasa, Call the men of Judah together to me within three days, and be he yourself. So Amasa went to summon Judah, but he delayed beyond the set time that had been appointed him. And David sent to Abishai, Now Sheba the son of Bikri will do us more harm than Absalom. Take your Lord's servant and pursue him, lest he get himself to fortified cities and escape from us. And there went out after him Joab's men and the Cherethites and the Pelethites and all the mighty men. They went out from Jerusalem to pursue Sheba the son of Bikri when they were at the great stone that is in Gibeah, and Amasa came to meet them. Now Joab was wearing a soldier's garment, and over it was a belt with a sword and a sheath fastened on his thigh. And as he went forward, it fell out. And Joab said to Amasa, Is it well with you, my brother? And Joab took Amasa by the beard with his right hand to kiss him. But Amasa did not observe the sword that was in his hand. So Joab struck him with it in the stomach and spilled his entrails to the ground without striking a second blow, and he died. Then Joab and Abishai, his brother, pursued Sheba, the son of Bikri. Be seated. Let's pray. Lord, we're thankful to have uh, these verses now uh, before us. I'm thankful for your whole word. Your word would be just as meaningful if there was a chapter. If there was just the 39 books or if there were just the 27, but we have them all. And so now, God, would you superintend the work of teaching this, the congregation, this, the group here, hearing this, the, the people with ears. May today's message be maybe not what they wanted to hear, but what they need to hear. So encourage those who need encouragement and challenge those who need challenge. Convict those with the necessary need to be convicted. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. As, as I was preparing, which I love to do, I, I began to look at this. I'm thinking, okay, 20, 26 verses. That gives me 36 to 40 minutes to do all of that. Like, I can, there's no way I can do this. Not in this text. And because we are tapering off, I, I wanted to spend and, and emphasize the first uh, 10 verses for you, and, and I, will, I will cover the rest all next week. And so, and so bear with me. But what I, what I was thinking as I was praying is, we're, we're sensing the idea of rebellion in the kingdom, aren't we? A frailty in, 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 in the leadership, a, a preponderance of, of those under David or those who, who desire to, 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 to rise to the top, to, to, to usurp David's leadership and try to become leaders themselves. This is what we're seeing over and over again, this, this division in the kingdom. And so what I'm, what I'm going to do this morning is I want to take this sermon and kind of give a modern, a modern day application, if I may. Now, please, I'm going to make some loose connections in the text but, but I, I, I'm going to explain the text first. Then I'm going to bring my drawdown to be at the end of the sermon. So let, let's just kind of warm up here. What I want to do is draw some parallels, how verses 1 to 10 is, is kind of like us. This is kind of the, 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 the story of, of fallen humanity. Our reticence to be led. Our, 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 our quickness to abandon a leader or, or, or somebody that we might have held in esteem due to our own reasons, not always good. We need to be on guard about this kind of posture like we see in David. I mean, not in David, in, in, in this chapter. I think this chapter does well to, besides painting the obvious reality that we can see that David's kingdom is coming to an end, right? It's coming to an end. That does not mean, as I say that, that David's kingdom is coming to an end, that God's place for David is over. God... God God already has a, a, an eternal place for David. Is that good news? But his kingdom on earth is, is coming for him personally. It's coming to an end. But God's faithful love for David is not changing with the end of this book. It does not change. So look at verses 1 to 2. Verses 1 to 2. Uh, some, I mean, David's coming back to Jerusalem, right? 
uh, Absalom, his son, uh, his, was, was killed. He was executed. And so now it's time for David to come back. Judah welcomed him. Israel welcomed him. And so now he's coming back into the city. Uh, he comes back to the city to begin his duties. And some welcome party, right? He's probably thinking, finally, it's over. I, I can finally resume my command and my leadership and all is going to be great. And this text says, now there happened to be a worthless man. Like, what a setup. There happened to be a, a worthless man whose name was Sheba, and, and, and the text introduces us to him. And it doesn't end for David, this, this, this friction. It's not ending. And much as he might like it to end, it's not ending. David is not popular with Sheba. Sheba has a disdain for David. And this man says he, he blows a trumpet. He, he, in other words, he, he wants to alert others of his goal. He wants to have a following. He wants people to listen to what he has to say. And he says, he makes a stance. And you, you can picture him just duck, digging in. We have no portion in David. We have no inheritance in the son of Jesse. Every man to his tent. He's saying, don't follow David. That, that, that's a takeaway. Don't follow David. Don't, don't, be, don't be enraptured by this person. And the text says, so all the men of Israel withdrew from David. And they followed Sheba. They followed Sheba, the, the what kind of man? The worthless man. But the men of Judah, it says, followed their king steadfastly from the Jordan to Jerusalem. We already know from the last chapter that it was Israel that was mad at David, and then, and then Judah was mad at David, and then Judah was happy with David, and then Israel was mad at Judah, and then the two came together, and now and they, it's never ending. The division in the kingdom is manifest in every singing, seeming verse as we turn from verse to verse. Now, that isn't fun. Now, let's jump to verse 3. Verse 3 says, David came to his house at Jerusalem. Again, this is why you can see that the text now is preparing our clothes. And David came to his house at Jerusalem, and the king took his ten concubines, whom he had left to care for the house, and he put them in a house under guard and provided for them. But he did not go into them, so they were shut up until the day of their death, living as if in widowhood. Now, this is telling you that another matter is on the mind of David. There's business that he has to deal with. Now, you might say, well, that's a, that seems like weird. That doesn't seem right, that he's not taking care of his wives or his concubines. But you will recall when he had to flee the city that he let his concubines remain. He thought letting them stay in the city proper would be a way to possibly help not uh, have the city be destroyed. Maybe it would give the, 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 the party who was trying to, to uh, dethrone David some patience or some degree in not letting that happen with immediacy. So he leaves them there. Well, what, what happened to the concubines? They were violated. Were they violated by, by invading armies? No, they were violated sexually by his son. By his son. And the, the Old Testament code does not allow for, if, 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 the, un, if the nakedness has been uncovered, which this would be a, a, such an example, if somebody was, was uh, defiled, which this would be an example, then of course this is the reason that David goes back to his concubines. He knows what has taken place. But he can no longer continue in the role that he had with him. So he meets their needs by shutting them in, a, in their home. He meets all their needs, but the text just gives us this sadness, right? It's a sad commentary that he will not go into them again. He will not lie with them. He will not, he will not love them in the fashion that the concubinage would have with them. It, that will not take place. And it's just the consequences of sin. Really, that's what it is. It's the consequences of sin. Sometimes we don't like the consequences, but they are that nonetheless. That's what that verse 3 is telling you, that he could no longer be with his concubines because they were violated by his son. Very, very sad. But let's get back to Sheba, because in the minds of, of David and in the minds of those who are with David, they want to make sure this situation does not get out of hand. Because we have another uprising taking place. I mean, I mean the, 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 the heat has been turned up up. And slowly the water is going to boil. And we know there's a time where you can put your hand in there and it's safe. And then you can put your hand in there a few minutes later and it's, you, know, okay, you can feel. And then after a while, you want hazard to do that. This is what David is trying to make sure doesn't happen. So we got to do something. And so what the text tells you in verses 4 and 5 is he, a, a new mission is given to Amasa. And Amasa, you remember, was the one to replace Joab. 
Joab was David's very strong, very able, very forceful, very great strategist who also had enough machismo that he could just get stuff done, but he was kind of a mess too, but he could be trusted. Well, Joab, because he disobeyed, was demoted, and Amasa was promoted. So here comes the very first task for Amasa. Let's see if he can execute it properly. And so he sends Amasa, and it says, go and find warriors. Go and gather a party. Go. You have three days. You have three days to go and bring troops so that we can deal with this matter. The first mission, get some warriors together from Judah. Now, can he do it? Well, I think the text asks us, or tells us rather, the answer to that. And apparently not, right? Apparently not, uh, because verses 6 to 8 in the text is telling us that as this is taking place, it says, David said to Abishai, the Sheba, now Sheba, the son of Bichri, will do us more harm than Absalom. Well, that's because verse 5 is saying Amasa went to summon Judah, but he delayed. He delayed beyond the set time that had been appointed to him. Did he have a struggle? Was his leadership not, not, not fully orb and able to, to meet such a task? Uh, is this the sovereign hand of God working? Uh, those are all good, good questions, and they, and they don't change the impact of the, of, the, of, the, of the narrative. But David knows something has to happen, so he goes to Abishai and tells Abishai, listen, we've got to do something. We have to do something. So he says, take the best guys that we have, Take the best warriors that we have. Take my mercenaries, which is what the text is doing there. Take the, the, the most able of, the, of mine. Take those who are able on your behalf and, and go and find Shiva lest he cause us more harm. And we've got to quell this rebellion now before it gets overwhelming. This is, is what is being told to Abishai. Pursue him before he gets away. Pursue him before he goes into the, one of the cities. He's hard to discover. We have a hard time finding him. Maybe they fight to defend him. And now we are in a long, drawn-out situation. This is, these are the directions to Abishai. Now, they run into Amasa at Gibeon. And, and let me just explain a couple things here. Let's go back to verse 8, if I, if I may. Remember I told you I was going to move this kind of quickly to bring an application here in just a moment. Look at verse 8. Let me back up to seven. And there went out after him Joab's men. Notice that Joab is here. You see that? Joab is in the party of the warriors. Joab is with, with, with Abishai. Joab has not been divorced entirely or he's inserted himself, but he's, he's a part. And, and it's a good thing, but he's here. And they went out after him Joab's men and the Cherethites and the Pelethites and all the mighty men. This again, this is that group of mercenaries and very able men the good wars. And they went out from Jerusalem to pursue Sheba, the son of Bikri, the one who was a worthless man. Eight. And when they were at the great stone, this monument in Gibeon, which, which we'll, we'll see other places, and we've seen other places, but I won't spend time there. Amasa came to meet them. So, so the one on his three-day dispatch, the one on his three-day duty is, is met en route as this new team of warriors is going, and, and they meet each other. And maybe for Amasa, he's like, oh, praise, praise the Lord in heaven above that you guys have come because I've been having a difficult time or, or I, I was late, you know, we got tied up or I had a stomach ache. Or who knows what the, what, what the reason would be, but they meet each other. And so the, the scene is set for us. But let me say again this, because this builds some tension. Joab was David's best. Okay. Joab was David's best. Joab was David's family member and he is brother to Abishai. So these are the people in the text, but Amasa is no stranger. Amasa is also family. He's also related. And Joab is known as one of the sons of Zariah. You know, those who, who always seem to have a desire to, 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 to do more than, than is necessary. The ones who will, will act, maybe the more, they're, they're more impetuous than, than maybe David would like, but they get stuff done. And he's, a, he's petulant, this Joab, but he's effective. He got demoted for killing Absalom, but here he is obviously in the warring party. One commentator says this about Joab. He says, quote, and I love it. Joab has always been loyal to David, but always beyond his control. But always beyond his control, end quote. Joab is that guy that will get stuff done. Like when you know there's a mess somewhere 
And like, you just can't send your normal Joe. You send in Joe Ab. And, and Joe Ab. And he will get it done. Now, it can be messy. And it is messy. But Joab is that kind. He's that kind of leader that accomplishes tasks, but those tasks can be done in a quite messy manner. Now look at verses 9 and 10. Verses 9 and 10. They meet each other, remember, at the Rock and Gibeon, and, and the, 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 again, the, the text is set up for you. I, again, it's, so, it's amazing. The preceding with eight was talking about the, the garment, a belt with a sword, with a sheath, and as, as Joab was walking forward, it fell out. Do you, do you see the setup here? And then verses 9 and 10 is the greeting. And Joab said to Amasa, Is it well with you, my brother? And so as, as, as he approaches, as the distance closes, in the customary Eastern greeting, he, would, he, he, he pretended to maybe drop his sword. And Amasa could see that, but he maybe didn't think anything of it. He was oblivious to what was in his other hand. And so during the greeting, he would hold on to the beard and as they were drawing close, he would thrust it into his abdomen. And the text does not hide the, the, the reality, but says that it was quite a scene, wasn't it? His entrails have come out. I've been a lot of places. I've been hit in the stomach a lot. I've never had my entrails come out. I don't think any of you, anyone had their entrails come out recently? Just, just had a show up? Okay, I didn't think so. It was quite a scene. And Joab kills with immediacy. He strikes once more. Now, that, that, that's no small matter because remember that Joab killed somebody else this way. I wrestled in high school. 98 as a freshman, 105 as a sophomore, 112 as a junior, 119 as a senior. I came out of the Marine Corps a year later at 155. Like the Marine Corps, they will put some pounds on you, right? They will put some pounds, or they will take it from you. It depends on how you're dealing with it. And why am I telling the story? I don't know. Oh, oh, I know why now. Because that's his signature move. That's the signature move. Who else, he, who else did Joab kill this way? Abner? Remember that? Who else did he impale in the tree, in the gut? Absalom. Who else does he kill here in the abdomen? He kills Amasa. My signature move was a single leg takedown. I just, I'm just saying that. I'll be out and sign aut uh, autographs later for anybody who's looking who wants to know. Anyway, I digress. You know, let's, 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 let's move on now. Praise the Lord. You know what I despise? I despise sin. I despise sin. My sin. I detest temptations. I don't want to be lured. I don't want to be distracted. And that happens to me. Ever happened to you? Look at, look at the opening of chapter 20. I mean, there happened to be there a worthless man. And the text gives you that word in the, in the ESV. He's a worthless man. Your, 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 your versions might use other language that does not reinforce that he's a positive character to follow. But this is what we see in the opening. And so I want to use that to launch into, into what I want to give you as seven things, I think, that we can learn from this text regarding our proclivity to not want to be led. Number one. Number one. Because I want to please myself a lot of times. And I think that's what we see as, as we look at this, these ten. I want to please myself. Number one, you want to journal this point, write this down. Satan is always looking to divide you. Satan is always looking to divide you. Just like in the text, we can see a continuing, repeating division amongst the people of God. It's continuing. It, like, like that's the goal of Satan is to divide us. It's also the goal of Satan to divide you from the Father. Not just divide you from your Christian brother and sister. That happens, certainly, doesn't it? I'm called on to mediate many times between family members in the church. But Satan wants to do that, but he also wants to div divide you from the ultimate authority 
of the cosmic variety, and that is your submitting to God. Satan wants to take you from that. The very first couple ever in the face of all of human history faced this idea that Satan is always looking to divide. You see it in the opening book of the Bible. It's that serious that the first couple would have to be immediately met, met by the enemy because Satan is always looking to divide you. Genesis chapter 3, verse 1 is, The serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field. And he said to the woman, Did God actually say? There's the introduction to division right there. Did God say that? Do you really think it's that bad to have premarital sex? What's, what's cheating on, on that? It's not, it's, everybody does it. Is it really that big a deal? Did God actually say, you shall not eat of any tree? And then, of course, the verse, verse 4 of, of chapter 3, you should reread the, the fall because it's, it's very, very, very clear. And the serpent tells the woman, you will not die. If you engage in this, if you do what God said you shouldn't do, don't worry about it. It's not going to matter. There'll be no, there'll be no extension of circumstances. It's okay. God, God misrepresented. That's what Satan is doing to you in every opportunity where you want to reject authority. Is he wants you to believe that there are no consequences and it doesn't really matter. And there are better things for you to pursue. The same thing is happening in the text. Satan tried this. Listen, here's how you know it's true for sure. Don't believe anything I've said, but believe this. If Satan will appear to Jesus to deceive Jesus, what makes you think you're beyond that? You can read about that in Matthew chapter 4. In Matthew, is Satan trying to do the same with Jesus? The second thing, this idea, I think we can see in the text, is Satan wants you to subvert authority. Satan wants you to subvert authority. He does. He wants you to subvert authority. He doesn't want you following King Jesus. He doesn't want you honoring the Lord in, in your life. He doesn't want you to have a different king because the, the scripture says that we were of our father, we were of our authority, fathers, our authority, right? Figures in, in the home. We were of our father, the devil, until someone else adopted you as a father. And Satan's been fighting against us ever since because he wants you back. He doesn't want you to be under the authority of another father. He wants you to be under his authority. So that's what Satan wants. He wants you to subvert the authority that you have to your current father, Jesus Christ. He wants to be king. And in our evangelizing over others, we can even sometimes see this is happening in Mark chapter 4. You know, in Mark 15, 4, 15, we see these are ones along the path where the world, word is sown. But when they hear, Satan immediately comes. He, he, he knows when, when we're trying to evangelize others and as we're trying to reach someone. And some of you probably have faced this, right? Your life didn't get complicated until you came to, to Jesus. Then your life got complicated because now the, 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 the fatherhood has changed. And now you're fighting and recognize, my goodness, this is worse than the beginning. And here is the enemy trying to take away. Paul says in Romans 13, this idea about authority, whoever resists authority resists what God has appointed. And those who resist will incur judgment. And I like what he says in verse 3. Rulers are not a terror to good works, but to those who do evil. You should not be afraid of, of, of government unless you are always trying to break the rules. In which case, that's why you're not going to like authority. Because you are, again, you are subverting authority. Revelation 12, 9, again, in, in the end is pointing to this time and the great dragon was thrown down. That ancient serpent called the devil, the deceiver, of the whole world, he was thrown down. Well, I'm looking forward to that time. How about you? We're looking forward to that time when, when our loyalty will not be divided, when we will not be threatened to follow someone who's worthless. But that's what we do every time we sin, is we follow and we embrace something worthless. It's not like it's something that's kind of good. Like it's, it's not like, like we would call God the superlative of, of, of the goodness and holiness and and anything less might be, might be good, but it, it's not that. It's like we go from the whole of the best to anything less than that is just trash. Pavlum. And this is what we do. Satan wants you to subvert authority. Again, look at this idea of Sheba. 
He was a son of Belial. A son of Belial. This is a word, and I can't spend all, all morning here. This is a term that's getting you to see an idolatrous nature, a licentious nature, a, a rebelliousness, a, a sense of no value, no worth, no morals, no integrity, no ethics, nothing. And, and what is not shocking is that a person like that exists because I feel like that sometimes when I'm given over to myself and pursuing what I want. I feel just as worthless. What's amazing to me, and you probably get this too, is that people follow him. That people follow him. Is that, is that, I mean, do you get that? Do you see in the text? But we do this. We do this even in this life. In, in 3 John, in verse 9 and 10, you, 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 you can see a, a similar reality here. Always trying to come and, and, and take away authority doing something else, like this person here. We want to put ourselves first. We want to be like Diotrephes. No, we, we're, we're worthless when that's the case. So number one, Satan is always looking to divide you. Number two, Satan wants to, you to subvert authority. Number three, Satan desires your affiliation with rebels. Satan desires that you affiliate with rebels. I mean, again, how else, I'm going to build upon this again, how else could a worthless person like Shiva get followers? And again, he does. He gets them. And, 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 and let me show you something here neat. Sheba is set right here as a man of Belial, and people follow him. David is set up in contrast, in distinction, as a man with God's anointing, who God has set apart, whom God loves, and he's called a man of Belial. And people follow him. And David is called a man after what? God's own heart. And people do what to him? Reject him. Do you see it? Do you see the tension in the text? They reject one after God's own heart and they embrace one who's worthless. This is what we do when we reject godly figures and godly authority. We are just going after a Sheba. It's amazing. Satan desires you affiliate with rebels. Again, let me just remind you, at Jesus' court was the same thing. At Jesus' court, you, you can see in, in Matthew 27, the, the, the people easily joined with, persecute Jesus. He, the, the, the rebels started to, to talk, and they were like, yeah, 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 persecute Jesus. Forget about the one who, who forget about Barabbas, the evil one. The, the insurrectionist, the evil, forget about him. Let Barabbas go. Persecute Jesus. Do you see how easy it is for us to do this? Satan desires you affiliate with rebels. And we can even join with the world and affiliate with it as we go along in its ways. Joshua 22, 29. And there's so many places where you can see it, even in the Old Testament, where God is continually over and over and over and over again. He's telling his people, you got to separate yourself. You can't be like those around you. You got to look different. You got to act different. You got to not do what the nations around you do. You, can, do you, or you will fall into what they do and you will be like them. It will, you will not make them clean. They will make you dirty. Let me say that again. They will make you dirty. You will not make them clean. So we got to be careful in our engagement with the world. And again, let me just say it again in another different way. The church faces this already. In 2 Timothy, in 2 Timothy chapter 4, the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves, not men after God's own heart, but they will look for Sheba. And Sheba will tell you, don't follow the shepherds. Follow me instead. This, this is the modern day church here. Happen then, it'll happen today. Let me ask you a question. Or let me just state it rather as a, as a statement. How needy we are looking for someone to join with, but turning from the one who's there. Right? How needy we are looking for something to join with, something to affiliate with, but the whole time Jesus says, come to me. And we don't come. Rest in me, but we don't rest. This is the human condition. 
you watch out, you watch out for the Shebas in your life. So now let's transition to what to do. Let me give you four things. Four. God wants you to prepare for battle. That's what, you, what God wants you to do. God wants you to prepare for battle. And the text will, will kind of flesh these things out, I'm going to say. God wants you to prepare for battle. David got the troops ready. He knew there was something that needed to be done. He wasn't going to sit idly by. He wasn't going to sleep on it. He, he was going to act. God wants you to prepare for battle. A fight was needed. And we're to fight sin. We're, we're to fight division. Whenever you are, are, are sensing some kind of division in the body or you, with you and the Lord or you and a church member or you and a family member, you're to fight against that. Recognize it for what it is. Listen, recognize it for what it is. Fight sin, fight division. And, and you prepare this by doing so many things. And let me give you a list of some of them. And I, I, what I ri- originally had written down here is you fight and you can prepare by things like studying the scripture, being together in fellowship, praying, aligning yourself with God's word, being with God's people. These are good ways to, good ways to prepare for battle. And then I went home and took my bike ride that day. And, and, and as I was thinking, what, what, what overcame my mind as I was thinking about my sermon was, if we're going to be prepared for battle, we need to never be ignorant and to not ignore the means of grace. And the means of grace encompasses so many things. And that's a church term that really is talking about honoring the Sabbath, being thankful that we have a Sabbath. It means um, not abandoning corporate worship. It means that we are, are gathering to worship in, in the Lord's house. It means uh, we are sitting under the preached word. It means uh, we are, are in a posture of prayer. It means we are taking advantage of, of, of the sacraments of baptism and the Lord's Supper. Those are the means of grace. And we're so thankful for the means of grace. And that's one way that you want and need to be prepared for battle. Hebrews 4.12, and I'm going to go very quickly through some of these verses. Hebrews 4.12 tells us that the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword. We're going to be able to discern where, where the enemy is trying to subvert authority in our lives if we are in our word. But a lot of us are not in our word, and so we don't know. Ephesians 6, 11 to 13 and 16 to 18 is talking about God showing you that you are to be prepared for battle because he gives you armor. God is telling you, you are in a war. You are in a battle. And so here's the armor. And here's how you are to be prepared and, and to engage. There you know. And I think Romans 12, 1 and 2 is a constant. Do not be conformed to the world any longer, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. You got Many of the times when I'm counseling a brother or a sister or a family, I just remind them of, of, a, of, a, of a change in their lenses. You've just been seeing that too myopically. You, you've just gotten off track. And after I tweak, their, then they're like, okay, yeah, thank you, pastor. Thank you. So much of us, we just need a renewal of our mind. That's it. Number five, so if God wants you to prepare for battle, God actually expects you to fight. Hello? God actually expects you to fight. Not be passive, not just hope Sheba will get COVID or, 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 you know, or, or die of old age. No, that, that, that you fight. Yeah, God fights for us. I, I, I'm saying that. I know don't, don't, no one will catch me afterwards and say, God, the Lord said that he fights for us. Yes, I know that. But you have to fight too. You have to fight as well. We have to do our part. Deuteronomy 141 reminds us of this idea of fighting and engaging. We have sinned against the Lord. We ourselves will go up and we will fight just as the Lord our God has commanded us. Yes, the Lord will fight our battles. Yes, He wins them for us. But we are still to fight. 1 Timothy 6.12, this idea of fighting again, of, of warring, of battling is, is present. We're to fight the good fight. God expects you to fight, people. Sixth, God knows you will be tempted, but kill that too. God knows that you will be tempted, but kill that also. Yes, we are to avoid sin, always. But temptations are battling us too. Anybody? Anybody in the house besides pastor? Just me, I guess. Okay, three others. Praise the Lord, Jesus. Five, thank you. All of you are tempted from time to time, aren't you? We recognize temptation. It's not a sin to be tempted, people. It's a sin to act on your temptation. It's a sin to give birth to your temptation. That's what's sin. 
If you have mind temptations all the time coming your way and you're being bombarded, listen, don't go home and loathe that life. We can loathe that it's a reality, but don't loathe that you're under some judgment of that. Loathe if you choose to act upon it. But we are to fight and kill temptation. Jesus told the disciples this in Matthew chapter 22. I mean, again, Jesus says, you guys, don't, don't, don't lose track of the mission here. Stay with me here. Stay awake. Be mindful here, lest you be tempted. I mean, if the disciples who walk with Jesus can be te- tempted, you can. James said in James chapter 4, verse 7 and 8, this again, about this idea of temptation, that we are to submit to God. And then resist the devil in that order. Submit to God, which is, it kind of lines up with my, my points. Submit to God and resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. And listen, let me just say this because some of you need this encouragement. You are not a lesser sinner if you face temptations daily. You are not a second class believer in Jesus if you face temptations. That's, that's the lay of the land, isn't it? as believers in Christ. That's the lay of the land. That's why we're so thankful for the gospel of Jesus. It's because we will face temptations. Jesus faced temptations. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 10, 12, that we're to be careful, that we're to not be over, overconfident because I can't tell you how many times I've counseled someone that I never thought I would ever do that. This is also a tactic of the enemy to think that you're above any kind of sin. And let me also point something out to you about this idea of temptation. C.S. Lewis says this, and I love it, and it's a little bit wordy, but listen closely. Quote, No man knows how bad he is till he has tried very hard to be good. A silly idea is current that good people do not know what temptation means. This is an obvious lie. Now listen. Only those who try to resist temptation know how strong it is. Listen. After all, you find out the strength of the German army by fighting against it, not by giving in. You find out the strength of the wind by trying to walk against it, not by lying down. A man who gives in to temptation after five minutes simply does not know what it would have been like an hour later. That is why bad people, in one sense, know very little about badness. They have lived a sheltered life by always giving in. We never find out the strength of the evil impulse inside us until we try to fight it. And Christ, because He was the only man who never yielded to temptation, is also the only man who knows to the full what temptation means. The only complete realist. So good. Well, we're out of time. Sheba was fighting against David, trying to get followers, doing the work of division. Satan is fighting against God, trying to keep sons from being adopted. And though David knows that this mess that he's dealing with is from the Lord, Psalm 39, 9, he has to fight and destroy the enemy nonetheless. He still has to engage. This is us. Which takes me to my last point, which is kind of a, an evangelical point. Number seven. God wants the unbeliever to know he's not even aware of the war. God wants the unbeliever to know he's not even aware of the war. If, if you here today have never surrendered your life to Jesus Christ, you probably have not really been even cognizant of the reality that there is a war. You've just been going about your own life in your own way and doing things that maybe you might deduce are ethically, you know, probably not the best decisions, but you don't understand the weight of the war that is for your soul. And you are going to lose that battle if you do not have as your commander Jesus. God wants you to know that there is a war. And like the New Testament would say when people realized they were sinners, when they realized that they were facing judgment and damnation, uh, they, they, they asked this simple question, what, then what must, what must I do to be saved? That should be the question you're asking this morning. Then what do I do, Pastor? You surrender to Jesus Christ. You repent of your sins. You turn to the Savior and say, forgive me, O wretched man that I am, who will rescue me from this body of death? 
Save me, Lord Jesus, and I surrender my life to you and I put my trust and my faith in you. Save me, Lord Jesus. What must I do to be saved? That's what you should be saying too if you've never placed your faith and trust in Jesus. Let us pray.